The Peter Schiff Show. Today's podcast is sponsored by Indeed. Indeed knows hiring needs to be cost effective when you're running your own business. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash Peter. Terms and conditions apply. Today's podcast is also sponsored by NetSuite, the easy-to-use cloud-based business management software for every aspect of your business. Now through April 15th, NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind flexible financing program. Head to netsuite.com slash gold. Good evening, everybody. Well, full disclosure, before I get into this podcast, I did have uh, a little bit to drink tonight. Well, actually, more than a little bit. I I just got back from a 17-course Uh, charity sushi dinner and the thing was they paired every course with a different sake and Japanese whiskey Uh, but I'm doing a podcast anyway you know I thought about maybe doing it tomorrow night but I got dinner plans tomorrow night as well and then I got a pack because I'm leaving on Friday for a 10-day trip to Mexico Uh, first four days I'm going to be in Mexico City this is going to be the first uh, shift sovereign conference. This one is exclusively for the all access members. Uh, So I'm looking forward to uh, seeing people down there. And it happens to be spring break for my kids. Uh, And so the whole family's going down there. And then after four days, we're going down to a ranch uh, to do some horseback riding. I haven't been on a horse uh, in many, many years. So we'll see. We'll see how I do. Uh, So I basically had to do the podcast tonight. Uh, oh, by the way, you know, if you're not getting the daily newsletters that Shift Sovereign sends out, they're really good. You should go sign up. If you're not getting them, go to shiftsovereign.com and, and sign up for those letters. In fact, there is a premium letter. And the first issue of that, the inaugural issue, is going out maybe tomorrow or next week. We've already finished it, uh, and it's it's set to go out as well. Oh, I want to make one other announcement too while I'm talking about these talks. I I you know, I'm I'm going to be on the Real Estate Guys uh Summit at Sea in June. Uh they haven't had one since COVID. They you know, they stopped because they do these things on a, on a cruise ship. And in 2020, you know, they stopped cruises. And so this is the first time they're back on the ship and I always enjoyed uh these cruises. They're a lot of fun, a lot of good people down there. I'm going to have my whole family there with me this time. I think my mother's coming, my young kids, my older son, uh, Spencer. I'm trying to get him to come. Uh, so if you guys want to join us, you can sign up uh, for this. It's an eight-night cruise in the Caribbean. So we leave from uh, and return to Fort Lauderdale. It's in mid, mid-June. mid uh, But you go check out the summit and see they still have some, um, some slots available. So I just wanted to, to mention that. Now, the, the big story today is the Fed uh, announcement and the Powell speech. As expected, the Fed left interest rates unchanged at five and a quarter to five and and a half. But the press conference, I thought, was another very dovish um, conference uh, by Powell. And the markets agreed because the Dow Jones and the S&P rallied to record highs. In fact, the Dow closed up better than 400 points. We're above 39,500. So we're almost going to hit 40,000 on on the Dow. Uh, We'll probably be there pretty soon, uh, given uh, the the green light that Powell gave to the, the, the speculators to go out and buy risk assets. Now, not just risk assets, safe haven assets. Gold rose about $30 during the U.S. session, uh, GLD, which is the U.S. uh, ETF, closed at a record high close. It didn't have a record high intraday, but the close was a record high. Now, already this evening, gold added another $15 to that run, hitting a new all-time record high. Gold traded above 2,200 an ounce for the first time ever, and silver had an even stronger day than gold. As I've been you know, saying on this podcast, silver is the real buy. I mean, gold's a good buy too, uh, but silver's an even better buy. And you know, it's now almost $26 an ounce. 
Uh, but you know, it's got a, a, a long way to go. And I think both gold and silver are going to rise. The dollar fell on the news. It didn't fall enough. I think it it's going to fall a lot more. Commodities in general, you know, I just posted, again, this chart of the CRB index on, on my Twitter account, which, by the way, since my last podcast, I have shot over uh, 1 million Twitter followers. So I think it might have been this podcast that put me over the, the top because after I finished the podcast, you know, I watched the Twitter and, you know, all of a sudden it, it jumped up and I got to over over a million. Now I'm almost 3,000 above a million now. But so on my, well, I'm sorry, I should have called it Twitter X. So I, I posted again, just look at it, the chart for the CRB. This thing is going to rip. I mean, this is a beautiful looking chart. Commodity prices, oil was down today. That's because it had got up to 83 and it pulled back and it's about 81.65. But copper, I mean, copper jumped up big again today, not as much as silver, uh, but you know, it was a good move. But I think we're on the verge of the biggest bull market in commodities since the 1970s. Now, of course, this flies in the face with Powell claiming that inflation is going to go back down to 2%. There's no chance that inflation is going to go back down to 2%. All the data shows that inflation is on the way up. Plus, if you understand what inflation is, it's got nowhere to go but up. And that, I think, is why the markets reacted the way they did, because Powell basically dismissed the bad inflation news that came out for January and February. I mean, he kind of said, well, it's due to seasonal effects. Well, it's already adjusted for that. <laughs> so it's like you can't say it's seasonal when the numbers are already seasonally adjusted. It's like saying it's transitory, which basically is what he said. So he dismissed it. And the Fed is still saying that we're going to get three rate cuts this year. But in addition to that, the, the even more dovish than that was the admission by Powell that they're going to begin shortly in reducing the size of their asset sales, quantitative tightening. They're going to pare it back. So they're going to start shrinking the balance sheet more slowly. Now, I've been saying the Fed is going to go back to quantitative easing. This is just the first step in that process. First thing they do is less QT, and then the next thing, they're back to QE. Because if the Fed really was serious about fighting inflation, the balance sheet is still much too big. It needs to continue to shrink. And interest rates are not high enough. they got to go up. In fact, let me look at a couple of the, the inflation uh, reports that we got after I did my last podcast on Wednesday, because I talked about the hotter than expected um, CPI. But what I didn't talk about was the hotter than expected PPI, which was even worse, that came out the following day. So the uh, February producer prices were supposed to go up by 0.3. They went up by 0.6, double what had been the estimate. And in fact, the range of expectations went from 0.2 to 0.3. So double the high end of estimates. Now, year over year, and producer prices had come down a lot mainly because commodity prices had come down a lot. Well, they're not going down anymore. They're about to explode. But anyway, so the expectation was for the year-over-year -year increase in producer prices to be 1.2. Instead, it was 1.6, up from up 0.9 in the prior month. Now, again, the range of expectations for the year-over-year PPI was up 1.1 to up 1.2, so a pretty narrow range, but we came out well above uh, the top end. And even if you take out food and energy, the core was supposed to be up 0.2 and it was up 0.3. But this was a bad report. And also, we got import export prices. The key in my mind is the export prices. Export prices were up eight tenths of 1% in one month. That's like a pace of like 10% inflation, right? Because export prices, I think, are more important than the import prices, although we, we buy a lot of imports that are still important. 
But to kind of show what's going on with domestic prices, because the export products, this, this is the stuff we make here, right? So the cost of our exports is going to reflect the production costs that are rising. And the prior month, January, Export prices were initially reported as up 0.8. They revised that to up 0.9. And then February was up another 0.8. Back to back, uh, big increases in the price of the stuff that we are producing here in the United States. So all of this, uh, you know, bodes ill for anybody who is expecting lower inflation. In fact, also, we got last week, and I didn't mention it on the last podcast, but I meant to. The February budget deficit came out, and the government reported almost a 13% increase in the deficit from the prior year. And in fact, the deficit in February was the biggest deficit in any February in history with the sole exception of February of 2021. Now, what was going on in February of 2021? The COVID, COVID stimulus checks. <laughs> you know, and, and so outside of this crazy year of COVID, we just had the biggest February deficit in our history, and we're supposedly in a booming economy. Everybody who talks about the economy talks about how strong it is. I was listening to Jeremy Siegel was on CNBC today talking about our booming economy, our strong economy. And everybody agrees we've got this really strong economy. Well, why do we have record high deficits? If the economy is so strong, where are all the tax revenues that this strong economy is supposed to be generating? Why are so many people uh, getting government checks? And also, the amount of money the government spent in February of 2024 is 50% more than it spent uh, in February of 2020, which was right before COVID started. So that was the last normal year, right? Before, you know, we went off, you know, into the twilight zone. But government spending is up 50% from where it was four years ago. And there's no emergency anymore. We have supposedly record low unemployment. How is that possible? Where is the government getting all this money to spend 50% more than it spent four years ago? This is why we have inflation. It's driving prices higher. All this money is being spent. How can it not bid up prices? And this is why the Fed is not only going to taper the QE program, but go, I mean, the QT program, but go back to quantitative easing because government spending is going ballistic. And all of it is stoking the fires for inflation. You know, Powell said uh, in his prepared remarks right off the bat that the Fed's interest rate policy has been putting downward pressure on inflation. No, it hasn't. There's no downward pressure from five and a quarter, five and a half percent interest rates. Those rates are still too low. They've done nothing to stop runaway government borrowing and spending, and nothing to stop runaway uh, consumer borrowing and spending. I got a commercial break. Uh, we're going to take this, and I'll be right back. We got a lot more to talk about, so stick around. We're driven by the search for better, but when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search. Match with Indeed. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messages so you can contact with candidates faster. And Indeed doesn't just help you hire faster. 93% of employers agreed. Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites, according to a recent Indeed survey. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. So the more you use Indeed, 
the better it gets. Join the 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. What I love most about Indeed is how simple it makes the hiring process and allows you to do all your hiring in one place. Candidates you invite to apply are three times more likely to actually apply for your job than the candidates who see it in search alone, according to U.S. Indeed data. Indeed gets you one step closer to the hire by immediately matching you with quality candidates. And now listeners of my show can get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash Peter. Just go to Indeed.com slash Peter right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash Peter. Terms and conditions apply. If you need to hire, then you need Indeed. All right, so during the commercial break, I checked the price of gold, and it is now at a new high. It's up $17 an ounce this evening. We're at $2,204. And I expect an even bigger move in the gold mining stocks. They could just explode higher tomorrow. They were up about 4 or 5% today, if you look at the GDX and the GDXJ. But, look, I wouldn't be surprised to see these stocks up 10 20% in one day and then keep going up. You know, I, I mentioned on a podcast uh, last week that the guys at Shift Gold are telling me that there are a number of people that are waiting for pullbacks to buy gold and silver. And I'm telling you guys, do not wait for a pullback. It's not worth it. The pullbacks will be quick and shallow. And so there's not a lot uh, of reason to wait. Uh, just buy, because the sooner you buy, the cheaper it's going to be. Because I think we're now just starting this turning process. The Fed is not hiking rates. The Fed is cutting rates, come hell or high water. It doesn't matter what the data is. right? The Fed is going to cut rates because the country is broke. They're not cutting rates because they won the war against inflation. They lost that war. They're cutting rates because they have to avoid a financial crisis, a banking crisis. They want to try to reelect Joe Biden. Uh, they want to uh, try to save the government from having to default and, and cut Social Security and cut Medicare. And so everything's going to be cut through inflation. And the markets haven't even really uh, come to this conclusion yet, but they may be just starting the process. So that is a big adjustment. And gold and silver have a long way to go, and they could start this with a very big move. Now, that doesn't mean that the stock market won't go up either, right? The the Dow could go up. The S&P could go up. I just think that the Dow is going to go up less than gold. And so what does that mean? If both the Dow and gold go up, but gold goes up more than the Dow, then the Dow is losing value in real terms. And in fact, if you go back to the beginning of the millennia, if you go back to the year 2000, gold is up more than the Dow, even though the Dow is almost 40,000. The gold price has gone up more than the Dow. But now the gold price is about to really accelerate and leave the Dow in the dust. Uh, And that just means that the real value of stocks is going to be falling. But I think there are going to be stocks around the world, emerging market stocks, I think, are going to really take off. I mean, there's going to be a big flight of capital out of the U.S., out of the U.S. dollar, because this is all inflation. You know, when Jeremy Siegel was talking about this strong economy, what Jeremy Siegel doesn't understand is it's inflation. He's confusing inflation with economic strength, because inflation can create an illusion that you have a growing economy. That's one of the reasons that government creates it. And that's especially true if your indexes underreport inflation, especially the GDP deflator. So when guys like Siegel are looking at the GDP and concluding, oh, we got this strong economy. No, we have strong inflation masquerading as a strong economy. Now, I was watching some of these interviews uh, on YouTube from, you know, uh, voters talking to, you know, in fact, they were talking to uh, some black people that were going to vote for Trump. And I guess that the media was like, oh my God, how can these people be voting for Trump, right? Because blacks hardly ever vote Republican. And now you got, I think like a quarter of black men or something like that were, are saying they're going to vote for Trump. I mean, that 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 that's never happened. Uh, for a Republican, I mean, at least a modern day Republican. I'm not talking about Lincoln type back then, but in the modern era, um, 
you know, blacks don't vote for the Republican. I mean, they just vote Democrat. But why would so many of them be voting for Trump? Well, you listen to these guys talk. And the reason is they're talking about how bad the economy is. They said they've never experienced anything like this. And they talk about the cost of living, the cost of food, the cost of everything. It's like we can't get by. You know, we're scraping to get by. Things are horrible. And so I'm going to vote for Trump because that's how bad everything is. And so even though um, inflation can create an illusion of economic growth, if you just look at the numbers and maybe the academics and the people on Wall Street, you know, they, they buy into it. The people on Main Street, these African-Americans who are going to vote for Trump, some of them it's going to be the first time in their lives <laughs> that they voted Republican because they live in reality and they know how bad this economy is. And if the main reason it's so bad is because of inflation, it's about to get a whole lot worse because the Fed is done fighting inflation. So the fight is over and inflation is going to now be able to run rampant without any pushback uh, by the Fed. You know, again, look at that commodity chart that I that I put up. Uh, prices are going to explode. Uh, and, and consumer prices are are going a lot higher. So the the, the public can see the reality of uh, of inflation a lot better than these uh, than these academics. But a couple of other points that I wanted to get into from what Powell said today. He kept talking about getting inflation down to two percent, but every time he said that, every single time. He said, we're going to bring inflation down to 2% over time, over time. Now, he never defined what the hell that means. I mean, how much time? He didn't say we're going to get it down to 2% next year, this year. Our goal is to have 2% inflation over time. So that's basically like eventually. So like when? In five years? In 10 years? I mean, how much time? Does the Fed need? How much time will it accept? Because the American public, they want inflation down to 2% right now. In fact, they don't want inflation down to 2%. They want deflation. They want prices to go back down because they're too high. But no, the Fed doesn't want that. The Fed just wants the high prices to keep going up just at a slower rate. You know, well, if prices are already high and you're hurting economically, what kind of relief is the fact that those high prices that you can't afford keep going up? They just go up more slowly. But, you know, the Fed in their wildest you know, mind would not consider maybe we can have prices going down because they think prices falling is, you know, economic Armageddon. We can never have that. We have to get this mythical 2% inflation even if we had several years of much, much higher in inflation than that. But also, you know, when Powell was talking about shrinking his balance sheet and someone said, you know, you know, what do you want to do? Powell said that right now he says that the Fed's uh, balance sheet is abundant, right? And their goal is to reduce it from abundant to ample. What the hell is that? I mean, he said that ample was a little bit less than abundant. But if you really don't know what abundant is, then how do you know what ample is other than it's just slightly less than abundant? And how much is slightly less? But again, remember, Mernanke, in 2009, when the Fed just started to increase the balance sheet, said that after the emergency, we're going to bring it right back down to where we started, right? We're not going to keep any of the bonds that we bought because we're not a banana republic. We don't monetize government debt. Well, now you have Jerome Powell saying we are a banana republic. We do monetize debt because we want to maintain an ample balance sheet, which is probably a balance sheet of at least seven trillion, right? Which is more than seven times the size that it was when the Fed started the temporary uh, QE program. Uh, so again, this was the uh, dovish nature of this speech where the Fed is completely thrown in the towel uh, on the reserves, on, on getting their balance sheet down 
uh, to any, anything close to normal. And of course, the balance sheet is going to grow because the Fed is going to go back to quantitative easing. They, they really have no choice. I mean, they have a choice if they're going to do the right thing. But because uh, I feel that that's not even on the table, right? Doing the right thing isn't even a possibility. I mean, they've never done the right thing yet. So why are they going to break with precedent? But I also know that doing the right thing is bad politics. And despite what they claim, the Fed is very political and they're not going to do something uh, that is unpopular. Uh, they're, they're, they're going to do whatever they can uh, to, to prop up this economy and reelect whoever happens to be the incumbent. Anyway, we got a second commercial break. So uh, we're going to take that and I'll be right back. Here's some quick math. The less your business spends on operations, on multiple systems, on delivering your products or services, the more margin you have and the more money you keep. But with higher expenses on materials, employees, distribution, and borrowing, everything costs more. So to reduce costs and headaches, smart businesses are graduating to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, bringing accounting, financial management, inventory, HR into one platform and one source of truth. With NetSuite, you'll reduce IT costs because NetSuite lives in the cloud with no hardware requirement, access from anywhere. You cut the cost of maintaining multiple systems because you've got one unified business management suite. You improve efficiency by bringing all major business processes into one platform, slashing manual tasks and errors. Over 37,000 companies have already made the move. So do the math. See how you'll profit with NetSuite. Now through April 15th, NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind flexible financing program. Head to netsuite.com slash gold. All right, so more dovish statements, right? It was a complete dove fest today at the FOMC meeting. Because again, you know, there are people who thought maybe Powell is going to react to these hotter than expected inflation numbers. Maybe they're going to push back on these rate cuts. And in fact, the odds of a June weight rate cut, which is what a couple more meetings, went up uh, sharply. So the markets are now more confident that the Fed's going to start cutting rates in June than they were before the press conference. But there was, you know, some you know anxiety probably uh, that Pal might have come out and said, you know, we got some bad numbers and we're on hold. You know, we're we're you know we're going to be cautious and we're you know. We may not be cutting rates. I mean, that's what he should have said. In fact, he should have raised rates is what he should have done. But of course, he's not going to do that. But there was uh, some fear that maybe Powell would come out and acknowledge that the inflation numbers were hotter than the Fed anticipated. And this was somewhat of a surprise. Uh, Now, Powell did say that the numbers validated the Fed's patience on cutting. He said, look, see, it's good that we didn't already cut because you see those numbers. But then he dismissed their significance and indicated that cuts are coming. And so that, that the, the markets, you know, reacted to that. But then he was asked about wages, you know, about wage gains. And he said, you know, we don't really care about wages. He said, I don't think inflation was caused by wages which that is true. I mean, that's one of the one things he got right. Inflation wasn't caused by wages. It was caused by the Fed. (laughs) And Powell and his buddies caused the inflation. As a result of that inflation, the wages went up, right? So he didn't didn't make that admission. He just said that rising wages didn't cause the inflation. They didn't. They resulted from the inflation that the Fed caused, that the U.S. government caused. But what he was telling the reporters, was that he doesn't care about rising wages. He's cutting rates. Now, even though raise, you know, uh, higher wages don't cause inflation, they are the result of inflation. So if wages are going up, that's a sign that there's still an inflation problem. Not that rising wages are causing the problem, but that inflation is causing raise, uh, wages to rise. It's like, you know, you, 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 you take your temperature with a thermometer 
and you know you're sick, the thermometer is not making you sick. Right? You're sick because there's something wrong with you. The thermometer is simply allowing you to confirm that you're sick is now you have a fever. And so the wages that are going up is like a temperature. And it's, it should be showing the Fed, hey, these wage gains are indicative of inflation because the wages are prices and they're going up because monetary policy is too loose. Government spending is, is, is too high. The deficit spending is causing inflation. And we can see the result of that in these rising wages. Right? Well, now Powell is saying, oh, we don't care about rising wages. We're going to ignore that. Uh, we're cutting rates. Said the same thing about the stock market. Somebody asked him about, you know, the stock market's at rest record highs. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> right? Why is the stock market at record highs? Because monetary policy is too loose. That's another indicator uh, that the Fed is too easy. The same thing with commodity prices. Commodity prices are ripping. Why is that? You know, and that's completely inconsistent. How can Powell, with a straight face, say that he thinks that we're on a glide path to 2% inflation when all these commodity prices are going up? They're not going down. And the reason that the CPI went from up 9.1 to up 3, the reason for that decline was a big drop in commodity prices, which is now being reversed. And before long, Commodity prices are going to eclipse the peaks where they started to fall. The next shoe to drop has got to be the dollar. Right? The dollar is going to have to cave as a result of what's going on. You know, in fact, since my last podcast, the Bank of Japan uh, did uh, uh, a rate hike. Uh, but the problem is, I think they're at 10, you know, 10 basis points or something. But they it was a very dovish thing because they dial back expectations. Uh, for more hikes. But look, this is just the beginning of a long journey. They have a huge inflation problem in Japan that they don't want to acknowledge. Rates are going up in Japan. And that means the yen is going up against the dollar. The yen is going to go down in purchasing power, right? Because you're, you know, you're going to need more yen to buy products in Japan. The one thing you won't need more yen to do is buy dollars <laughs> because the yen is going to lose less value than the dollar given the fact that the yen is already way down. But this is going to be another big problem uh, for U.S. inflation because the dollar is not just going down against the yen. It's going down against pretty much everything. But in particular, the dollar is going to be the weakest against the currencies of the countries that we're doing the most imports from. And so that's going to directly affect all of the costs of everything that we import. And of course, Everything that we import needs to be shipped here. And all those shipping costs are going to go way up. It's going to cost a lot more money to hire the ships. And it's going to cost a lot more money to fill them up with fuel. So not only are our import prices going to go way up, but the cost of bringing all those imports into the country is going to go way up. And that also means the cost of sending the ship back empty is going to go way up. because our import costs are so expensive because we have to cover the round trip of the ship. See, if we had a balanced economy and we actually produce stuff, and again, we got more bad manufacturing data. I'm not even going to go over it, but pretty much every manufacturing uh, you know, data point that came out after my last podcast, which was Thursday and Friday of last week and Monday, Tuesday of this week, it was all bad. Right? Everything was below estimates. But if we had a, a normal economy, a viable economy, uh, trade would be a two-way street. So we would import stuff. So the ships would come to America from Asia full of stuff. And then we would empty all the containers, take all the merchandise out of the ship, and then fill that ship back up with our stuff that, that, that we're sending over there. And so the ships would be full on, on both legs of the journey, you know, which would reduce the overall shipping cost, right? Because we would, you know, we would pay uh, to ship. And so the people of the other countries would be able to cover uh, the cost because it would be built into the price of the stuff they were buying from us. 
But because we got nothing, the ships come to America full, and then they leave empty. So now you've got this huge cargo ship that has to go back from the U.S. to China, wherever it came from. It's got to go all the way across the ocean with no cargo. So who covers the cost? Well, all of that has to be priced in to the goods that Americans are buying. We have to pay the round trip. Uh, so when uh, cost to rent ships and the fuel goes up, it, it makes a, a disproportionate impact on import prices. So we are on the verge, really, of an inflation tsunami, which is kind of ironic because this is when you know the Fed has taken its victory lap and Wall Street and everybody is like, okay, it's over. You know, God, we... You know that we dodged that bullet. You know, inflation reared its head, but you know the Fed raised rates to five percent. All good. Five percent—that's low. I mean, you you go back and you look at where uh, the Fed funds rate discount rate was in the you know fiat currency era, right? So post nineteen seventy one, when we we were really off the gold standard, we have inflation. You know, just pure fiat money. If you just exclude. Uh, the zero interest rate time frame, right? You know, since 2008, because that's that's not normal. That was a complete aberration, the 0% rates. So forget about that. Just go before the 2008 financial crisis. And of course, before then, we did have rates at 1%. They got the 1% for about a year and a half, right? But even including that, you go back 5%, five and a quarter where we are. That's not high. That's maybe about average for a Fed funds rate. So how are you going to fight a, a resurgent inflation with average interest rates? I mean, you're clearly you're not. It's not going to happen. And the proof is in the level of spending. I've been pointing that out. Deficit spending continues to rise despite the fact that interest rates went up. In fact, higher interest rates are fueling bigger deficit spending because the government is borrowing more money to pay the higher interest rates. And even though credit card interest rates are at a record high, credit card debt is at a record high. So those high interest rates are not discouraging consumers from taking on more debt. So that tells you that they're not high enough. Whatever the Fed did to fight inflation, it did not work. Now, yes, did the rate come from you know, uh, 9% to 3%? Yeah, and that probably means it went from 18% to 6%, right? It's still really, really bad. But the only reason it came down is, A, it doesn't go in a straight line. It ebbs and flows. So you're, you know, you're going to expect a kind of wave. And so even if inflation is going to go from 9% to 15%, it doesn't mean it can't go back down to 3% first and then go to 15% and then go down to 7% and then go up to 20%, right? I mean, it's going to ebb and flow uh, as it gets worse and worse and worse. Uh, but the main reason this happened was the market started to anticipate all these rate hikes. And in anticipation of these rate hikes, the dollar went up, oil and other commodity prices went down. And that's what really um, put downward pressure on the CPI numbers. And so, you know, we got a little relief, but but that's over. That's in the rear view mirror. All we've got in the windshield are rate cuts. So what's going to happen to inflation? And if it's already, you know, at three and change, and now the Fed is cutting rates, what does that mean? And they're going to go, they're going to slow down QT and go back to quantitative easing. We got all the deficit spending. It, it, it's clear that rates are going up. And in fact, the, the, the rates are already much higher than they were because everybody got hooked on 0%. And so the increase that we've already seen is already built into the uh, cost numbers. But even though the Fed is going to be cutting rates, I think longer term rates are going to rise this time. They're not going to fall. In fact, even though you got a bit of a drop in the five and the 10 year, the 30 year treasury rates went up today. And so the yield curve steepened. And I think that's the big shocker here. That's what 
nobody is expecting is that uh, long-term rates are going to rise even if the Fed cuts. And so that is going to increase interest expenses and therefore put more upward pressure on prices because uh, borrowing costs are going to go up for most borrowers who are not borrowing uh, at the, you know, the, the Fed funds rate, right? So, and you're going to see this happening with a weaker economy, which is also something that we haven't experienced. In these past cycles, when the economy has weakened, one of the, uh, you know, the relief that we get is we get a drop in, in interest rates, long-term interest rates, mortgage rates go down, and then everybody can refinance their mortgage. Well, during the next recession, no one's refinancing their mortgages because the rates are not going to get down to where they were before. We're never going to see a 3% mortgage again. That, that's gone. So we're not going to have that kind of stimulus in the next recession. In fact, I think long-term interest rates are going to rise. Even if the Fed is doing QE, rates are going to go up. Now, they might go up even more if they weren't doing QE, but they're going to go up because inflation is going to drive them up. And again, that's the other thing that everybody expects. They think, well, at least if we have a slowdown in the economy, well, at least we'll get the benefit of lower inflation. No, we're not going to get that. We're going to get higher inflation. We're going to get stronger inflation in a weaker economy. So it's going to be a weak economy. And in that weak economy, interest rates, long-term interest rates and inflation are both going up. Now, we haven't experienced anything like that since the 1970s. The difference is we're in much worse shape economically than we were in the 1970s. And we don't have the ability right, to uh, put out this fire. We're not going to get another Ronald Reagan. We're not going to get another Paul Volcker. And even if they were there, they couldn't do what they did back then because of the financial position, the weak position that America now occupies that it didn't occupy back in 1980. So it's a whole different ball game, and it's going to have a a very different ending. And you got to be prepared for it. You know, people have got to have their portfolios in order. You know, you got to have uh, the type of portfolio that, that did well in the 1970s. You can't stay with what worked. You know, the people who didn't make the change in 1970, if, they, if you stuck with a 1960s, you know, nifty 50 portfolio, you know, with Polaroid, you know, and, and Xerox and all those stocks, you got killed, killed in the 1970s. What, what made money in the 1970s? Gold stocks, oil stocks, Japanese stocks. You had to invest in commodities. You had to invest abroad. Uh, you had to get out of the dollar. You had to get into gold. Well, you have to do it even more now. I think the returns through global investing, through commodities and gold, will even more outperform the U.S. market, you know, in this coming economic period than they did during the 1970s. So it's even more important uh, that you make the switch to your portfolio. Now, of course, I made the switch years and years ago. I saw this train wreck coming from a mile away. Now, maybe if my vision wasn't quite so clear, you know, I could have rode the bubble a little longer uh, and, and, and then, you know, made the switch now, right? It, it'd be better uh, but at least I'm there. At least I'm in the right place. And I think the gains that we're going to have on some of these stocks are just going to be enormous and they're going to be rapid. And I, th I think I'm going to quickly catch up to where I might have been, you know, had I been in the S&P as opposed to international stocks and gold stocks. And then I will pass it. I think eventually I'm going to pass the NASDAQ. Now, that's tough because we've had a huge run in the NASDAQ. But if the, if these are the stocks that are going to get hit hit the most. You know, these growth momentum oriented stocks, they're going to get clobbered by the reality of stagflation because these stocks don't make sense at all in stagflation. It's only because nobody realizes that that's where we're headed, uh, that people are, are buying these stocks. And again, they're buying a momentum, just like, you know, people uh, buying in, in, in cryptocurrencies. By the way, Bitcoin, you know, got up last week, 
got up to uh, almost 74,000. And yesterday, it was back down to 62,000, down 15% in, in four days, right? Now, it's, it's rising back up again, uh, not at new highs. I think uh, last I checked, it was around 67,000. Uh, let me take a look at uh, at where it is now and see uh, see what it's you know what it's doing here. I got these um, uh, other charts up on my uh, oh I got rid of that. Let me I gotta bring it up. Um, let me see. But um, and I think you know still now I mean Bitcoin is still getting all the headlines. In fact, you know I I was watching on CNBC. On was it um, on, on Tuesday, right? So yesterday in the morning, <laughs> and and Bitcoin was down um, like six percent overnight, right? And, and what a, a huge move! Probably the biggest down move it's had, I think, in one day since these ETFs launched. And I'm waiting to see, you know, how they're going to talk about it. And I, I'm I got the TV on for an hour from seven to eight. This show Squawk Box didn't even mention it. Another hour goes by, eight to nine. Nobody brings up Bitcoin. They say, hey, let's look at the markets. Oh, here's the stock market. Uh, here's what's happening in the NASDAQ. Here's this. No mention. MicroStrategy stock, one day, it was down 17.5%. And they didn't even mention it. Now, when MicroStrategy is going up, I mean, they talk about it all the time. When Bitcoin goes up big overnight, it is the lead story on Squawk Box. It's the first thing they talk about. And then they don't stop talking about it. But now you have a big down day and it's crickets. I actually waited about three and a half hours before Bitcoin was even mentioned. And then they didn't even mention how much it was down. It was just like mentioned in passing. So it's like they don't want their viewers to even know when Bitcoin goes down. But when it's up, that's all they want them to know. right? And of course, they don't talk about gold at all. Uh, you, you'd have no idea that gold was at a record high if, if, if you were watching on CNBC. But so Bitcoin is 67,700. Uh, so, you know, it's had a big pop and it, and it went up today along with everything else. And of course, that's what they focused on. Oh, look at the big rally in Bitcoin. Yeah, but it's not at a new high. Gold is at a new all time record high. That is significant. What's happening in Bitcoin is completely insignificant. You know, I, I did this debate with Rob Paul. And it's, you know, it's up on the internet on YouTube. It's got almost 800,000 views. So a lot of people have, have seen it. And if you read online, all the, you know, the reports about this debate, because all the Bitcoin, you know, online publications, you know, they, they write about it, you know, and everything is like Peter Schiff gets slaughtered by Rob Paul. Rob Paul destroys Peter Schiff. Like <laughs> he didn't destroy anything. But if you read the comments on the video, yep, everybody, Peter's an idiot, right? I mean, comment after comment. So I guess the only people that bother to watch it are the crypto fanatics. And I don't know if I was able to, you know, talk some sense into any of these people. But this is how, you know, thick a lot of their heads are. I mean, if you watch this thing, he, he, he said some very ridiculous things. And some of the things I didn't even have a chance to really get into, like, you know, it's, he doesn't think that there's a difference between Bitcoin and a stock, even though a stock has earnings and can pay dividends. Uh, and, you know, he says, well, it's no different. You know, it's it's the same. <laughs> you know, he can't tell the difference. Um, th this is how ridiculous um, the whole thing is. If you can't tell the difference between a digital string of numbers. And, and he kept talking about how Bitcoin, you know, is is helpful in energy like it uses energy you need energy to create bitcoin now the whole bitcoin community is somehow saying that bitcoin is a positive thing for the energy industry how is it possibly a positive when you waste all this energy to create it because you, you you create nothing yet you use valuable energy that could have been used to create something instead we wasted it Creating nothing. But if you haven't watched um, the 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 debate, uh, that you know, it's a couple of hours. Uh, it's up there. So, um, but all these guys are just you know, they're they're have no clue. Uh, 
thinking that, you know, I lost this thing. In fact, the one thing they took out of it, and I, I got to laugh out of this because if you Google my name, there's dozens of headlines from online publications about, about this. So uh, I was asked if I regret not buying Bitcoin at a dollar or, you know, whatever I looked at it, I forget it, you know, a couple of bucks, wherever it was. It may have even been under a dollar. I can't remember exactly where it was. But he said, well, do you regret not buying it? Well, I mean, of course I regret not buying it. I mean, who wouldn't? I mean, if I bought it at a dollar and now it's at 70000 how could I not regret not buying it? Of course, I said, yeah, sure, I wish I had bought it. I mean, what idiot doesn't wish they bought it? In fact, even the people who did buy it probably wish they bought a lot more. I mean, sure, I should have put everything into Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, hindsight is twenty twenty. There's a lot of things I wish I would have done now that I know, you know what happened. Although with Bitcoin, it is a little different because I actually considered buying it uh, when it was down there. I mean, I thought about it. I almost did do it just as a lark, just for the hell of it. I almost did it and I, and I didn't do it. But it wasn't because I really believed in it. I was just going to, you know, what the hell? I'll just do it and see what happens. Just, you know, you know, take a shot. Um, and sure, I mean, although I don't know, you know, would I still have it? You know, how much would I still have? But sure, I mean, there's no way I would have lost money had I bought it back then. So the question is, how much would I have made? Would I have made a few million? Would I have made a few hundred million? Would I have made a billion? I mean, maybe. So yeah, sure. And so now all these headlines, like Peter Schiff regrets not buying Bitcoin. He's changed his mind. He flips, right? Peter Schiff is a convert. You know, he like, what does that have to do with anything? You know, I still don't believe that it's going to work. I would be every bit as bearish on the long-term future. My comments would be the same whether I bought it or not. It's just that if I said, no, I, I, I don't regret not buying it at all. I mean, that, I would look ridiculous. It wouldn't even ring true. How could you not regret it? Now, do I stay up at night? Am I like, ah, shit, I should have. No, it doesn't bother me that I didn't buy it. But sure, you know, I, j I wish I had bought it because I'm sure I would have made uh, some money. Uh, but I would sell it. I mean, even if I bought it back then and I lost it somehow, and I just found it yesterday. Somehow I had it on some kind of flash drive. And fortunately for me, I wasn't able to find it. And I and, and all of a sudden, here it is. <laughs> I would sell every one of them, right? So it doesn't change my perspective just because I regret not buying it at a dollar now that it's uh, 70000 But I did want to finish up the podcast, just a little bit of politics. But not so, more, not so much politics, but media. Because it really reinforces something that I talked about with, with the way that media covered me in my bank, right? They, they lie about me. They lie about the bank. Then I sue for defamation and I win. And then the media lies about my victory. They won't even report, honestly, that I sued for defamation and that I won, right? They, they don't want to admit when they get something wrong. Even if they lie, they, they don't want to admit to it. Well, you have a perfect illustration of this with what happened uh, with the way the media reported a comment that Donald Trump made um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a speech talking about the automobile industry and what was going to happen to it if Biden got reelected, because Trump thinks that the market's going to be flooded uh, with uh, cheap Chinese cars built in Mexican plants that are coming into the U.S. tax-free. And so he's saying if this happens, uh, the U.S. auto workers are going to lose their jobs because Americans aren't going to buy U.S. built cars. They're going to buy all these char cars made in Mexico. And so he says he's going to put 100 percent tariffs. He's not going to let these cars in. Um, now, I may not agree with Trump's policies, but in that speech, he said, if I am not elected and I don't put these tariffs on these cars, it's going to be a bloodbath uh, in the auto industry. He's talking about all the, the workers that are going to lose their jobs, right? It's going to be a bloodbath, right? Now, the media takes that word bloodbath and they immediately take it completely out of context, knowingly, knowingly taking it out of context. And they report it 
as if Trump said that if he doesn't win re-election, there's going to be a bloodbath in the streets, meaning that his supporters are going to go on a murderous rampage and they're going to start killing people and there's going to be blood in the streets. And so he better win or else. Like it's going to be another January 6th, which of course was a complete hoax. You know, now we know that Donald Trump tried to call out 10,000 National Guardsmen to supposedly stop the coup that he started, the insurrection. And the Washington establishment, oh, no, we don't need those National Guard troops. We're, we're, we're fine. Thank you, Mr. President, for offering to send us the National Guard, but we don't want it. Um, and so the whole thing was a fraud. But they take this out of context. And they say, hey, look, you see, there's going to be another January 6th if he loses. And now they're, what kind of man is this? How can he say this? And they all know that they're lying. And what's worse about it is they got to know that we're going to see the whole speech, yet they lie anyway. And even after they're caught, like Joe Scarborough, you know, uh, Morning Joe, even after he's caught red-handed, right, taking the president knowingly out of context and lying deliberately about what he said, pure fake news, he's still sticking to his story. Oh, no, no, that's what he meant. He didn't mean bloodbath in the auto industry, even though he was talking about the auto industry. He meant a real bloodbath. He meant that they were going to go on a murderous rampage. And now he's just trying to backpedal. But no, he really is advocating violence in the street, which is a complete lie. This is the hubris they have. They, they just can get away with it. They can say whatever they want without regard for the truth. Right? It, this is not news. Right? We don't have news anymore. Uh, on ABC, NBC, CBS. It's not like we got Walter Cronkite, you know, that's the way it was, or Dan Rather. I mean, these guys were liberal, but they reported the actual news. They didn't let their politics color their, their, their reporting of the news. They took that job seriously. We don't have any of that anymore. This is all pure propaganda. And these people are deliberately lying. They can't be idiots. They know what the president said. They have to. They can't be that dumb. Just like the reporters who wrote the story about my bank, when people are telling them how difficult my compliance is, how it's over the top, how many questions we asked, how many forms they had to fill out, how it took weeks and weeks and weeks to get an account. And then they write a story that says there was no compliance. Right? They, they looked the other way and they had all these criminals. And there are no criminals. I, got, we go, I sue them for defamation. They say hundreds of criminals have accounts at the bank. And we say, OK, name one. And they can't come up with a single one. Right. It's lies. They know they're lying. But what's worse is they know they can get away with it because they've got each other's back. Right. All the other reporters. That's why no reporter will report that these guys lost the defamation suit. Right. They're keeping it under wraps. And then Wikipedia says, well, we can't put on your page that you won the defamation lawsuit. Because there's no uh, credible source in the media that says that you won. And we can't go to Nick McKenzie's page and, and write that he lost because there's no credible news source that reported that he lost. And I said, well, here's the court's website. Here's the federal court from Australia that says I won, he lost. Oh, that's no good. We can't take that as a source. We need it in a newspaper. Oh, here's a newspaper, the Daily Wire. Oh, that's no good. They're too biased. We can't accept the Daily Wire, right? This is how biased everything is. It's it's just all lies is, is what you get from the mainstream media, which is why it's so important that you have shows like this podcast and not just my podcast. I mean, that's how you get truth. You can't get it uh, from the mainstream media. You're just going to get a bunch of lies. Uh, so thankfully, we have the Internet and there are people out there you know, who will give you the truth uh, and, and, that, and, and arm you with, with, with that and, and help you see through the smokescreen that is being created uh, by a highly biased, you know, socialist uh, mainstream media. Anyway, that's it for today's podcast. So uh, my next podcast, I, I will have to do that one from, from Mexico. Uh, and so um, I'm not exactly sure when I'm going to do it, 
Uh, but I'm gonna, I'm definitely gonna try to get at least one podcast in on on my trip. Maybe, maybe a second one. You know, depending on what happens, I I, ha- I have a feeling that it's gonna be a big week. You know, I think you're gonna see a lot of movement uh, in in gold uh, over the next week or so, and uh, and the dollar. And so I, I'm probably gonna feel compelled uh, to interrupt my vacation a little bit uh, to uh, to address everybody on the podcast. Anyway. Bye for now and uh, have a great weekend. Oh, and by the way, uh, the 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 second day I'm in Mexico, March 23rd, that's my birthday. So I'm going to have uh, a birthday. I'll be 61 uh, the next time I, I do a podcast. So I'm really getting into my 60s now uh, that I'm no longer six, 60 even, uh, but 61. And, uh, you know, it's it's not easy getting old. Anyway, bye for now.